into the world and they wrapped him in the same wrapping that they swaddled little uh, lambs that were destined to be sacrificed. That's how he came. They knew he came, he came to give his life. And that's what he did. And I was thinking, when he told his disciples during the Last Supper to do this in remembrance of him, he was about to die. I mean, Jesus came in the flesh and he struggled. He, he, he sweated drops of blood. He was so in so much anguish. This was a big deal to him. <laughs> he understood its meaning. He understood what he was about to do. He understood he was about to give life and set the world free. And we're to, we're to receive this with the same seriousness as he did at the cross. Amen. You know that That last supper was done at the time of Passover. They were celebrating Passover. They were celebrating when the people of God were freed from their bondage. God's intervention into Egypt so exasperated so tired out Egypt that they were happy <laughs> to let them go. If you read the word, like, here, go. Don't think your struggle is for nothing. And it said that after they took, they ate the Passover bread, they were supposed to make it in such a way, they called it the bread of haste because they had to prepare it quickly. God wanted them to exit quickly. So it's called the bread of haste. That's why it's called that. And that's what they took. It was unleavened. It represented the body of the body of Jesus. And leaven represents sin. It had no sin in it. And it said, listen to me. It said when they when they left, you know, we, how many of you ever seen the Ten Commandments, the movie The Ten Commandments? You remember, remember that scene where they're all leaving and it's like the crippled guy and so forth. I love that movie. I watch it. I watch it a lot of times. But it's not totally accurate. There are some inaccuracies. And the, and the thing that the word says, it says, when they left, there were none feeble among them. There was nobody sick when they partook of that bread. Now, I don't really know how to pastor a church during a world epidemic. <laughs> but I know one thing. I'm not going to rely on the faith of the world. I'm not going to re rely on the faith of the media. And I'm not going to rely on the faith of the medical community. I love them and I'll do practical things. I'm going to rely on the faith of the Lord. Amen? Anybody with me? And so there it is right in front of you. The bread of life. Passover bread, the body of Jesus. He says, take this. And I want you to think about those things that you're struggling with in your body right now. I want you to lay those before. You didn't get me any. And I want you to think about even this thing that's trying to bring fear into your life. I believe, I believe in this is a house of healing. I don't think it's a house of sickness. I don't think this is the bread of sickness. I think it's the bread of health. Now, I'm speaking to your faith right now. I want you to think about your family. I want you to think about your loved ones. I want you to set aside your worry. I want you to set aside your anxiety. I want, to, I want you to set aside your stress. I want you to set aside the reports of the world. I want you to set those things aside. And just for a moment, I want you to believe that you're about to partake, because that's what you're about to do, the body of Jesus right now, the incorruptible body.
And I believe the enemy that's been tormenting your body, that's been tormenting your mind, will be happy to leave. <laughs> will be happy to get us out of here. Come on. Heavenly Father, right now, we thank you for the bread. We thank you for the body of Jesus. Lord, you said that there are many sick among us because we don't discern the body correctly. Well, we're discerning it correctly right now. With every, everything in our being, we believe. And right now, Lord, let miracles take place all over this house. Lord, for those that are interceding for loved ones and friends and children and parents and grandparents, even those that might even be sick right now, we intercede for them right now. We know there's power. We, you never ask us to do anything if there's not power. We thank you for your body. And just like you broke it, we break the bread before you in remembrance of that your body was broken. You took the stripes on your body. You took the beatings. You took the infirmities from your head, from the crown of your head, to the piercings in your feet, throughout your body. There isn't anything that you haven't covered. There isn't anything that's impossible in your presence. And so right now, we thank you and we receive of the body of Christ. Let's partake. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
This coming Friday night, January 8th, we're having a moms and children's night out here at church. All the moms can bring the children. We'll have stuff for the children to do, and then us moms can socialize, and we're gonna have food and just hang out and have a good time together. Saturday, January 30th, there's gonna be a women's breakfast here at church at nine in the morning. There's a sign-up sheet in the back. Um, if you want to attend, you can bring food. My mom, Donna West, she'll be the speaker and she's gonna give her testimony. And then save the date, because in February, February 20th, the men, they're gonna have their own breakfast. And us ladies are going to come and cook for them for their breakfast. So save the date for that. More details will come. Pastor Paul. Thank you, Shannon. Morning. Morning. God bless you. Happy New Year. <laughs> Anybody happy to see 2020 go? Yeah. All right. I don't know. There might have been more good than you realized that happened in 2020. Amen. 2020 was a wake up call. Amen. Some of us need to be need to be woken up. That's right. Woke, wake up. Woke up. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Brother Toby, I appreciate you bringing the word last week. I mean, appreciate Toby's word last week. I got to listen to it. I got to listen to his testimony. Of course, there's a lot more to his testimony than he gave last week. But I love what he said, that, that faith, is, faith is obedience. I'll tell you what else faith is. Faith is inconvenience, too. <laughs> Faith without works is dead faith. Sometimes you got to step out. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I, I tell you what, we saw a lot last year. Uh, I feel like the, the enemy has tried to come in like a flood. We've seen pestilence and riots and civil division and corruption at some of the highest levels of our government. And even a, a overthrow of what our founding fathers have established in this country. Um, and, uh, you know, I believe even us in the church it has allowed so much mixture into our church that we, we don't know how to discern between good and bad anymore. Uh, but I think that's changing. Um, I don't think Satan's done. Um, I don't think we just leave it behind in 2020. There's probably a carryover. I believe the church is supposed to be strong, and um, I believe we're, we're. I believe when the Lord comes, that He's He wants to find faith, Amen. faith on the earth. Amen? Amen. I got a couple of announcements. Uh, speaking of faith and obedience, uh, we as leaders are uh, going to step out in faith and we feel God wants us to complete the exterior of this building as you notice some of the work has started and we were kind of forced into it because the south side of the building sustained damage because the one thing I've learned not only from attending church here but living out here now is the wind and the snow and the rain and the sleet is relentless out here it comes from the comes from, a lot of times it comes from the west, doesn't it, Dave? Of course, Dave's probably known this for a long time. Uh, and there's nothing that breaks that thing. So it, that moisture got under the brick. It's on, on this also, the west side. And um, it's just gotten underneath a lot of that. So we, um, we're using that as a reason <laughs> to improve the whole exterior of the building. And if you want to know what basically we'd like it to look at, you just look at those renderings in the back. So we're going to take a step of faith. Um, we don't know entirely, but it's probably going to be in the, uh, probably in close to the $300,000 level. Um, we have enough money uh, saved and set aside to begin this side. Um, uh, but, you know, the I'm letting you know so you know what the needs of the church are. 
I'm not looking to pull an offering. I, I, I don't do that. I don't believe in that. Um, I believe that when the Spirit of God truly hits, people aren't going to be able to help it. I know that when I when I begin coming and the Spirit of God begin to hit me, I begin, I didn't know why I was giving. I was I was giving, and so God wants a cheerful giver. If God lays on your heart to give. We want you to give, and you're going to know what you're giving to. Because I believe that God is God wants to put this place on the map. He's doing something very unusual in this house. I'm telling you right now. I talk to ministers not only in this area but around the country, and I don't know anyone that's ha what's happening in this church. What's happening? So some, something's happening. But I want you to know we're going to step out in faith um, and just begin to. You're going to start to see the construction, and we're going to. We're going to our goal is to work in the front. We want the front to look beautiful. We think the house of the Lord should look beautiful. Uh, and we believe that where there's a vision, God brings the provision. And uh, and, and I, I just feel to let the, the, the body of Christ to stand with us and to believe with us. If God lead, leads you to do something, do something. But uh, we're excited about it. And uh, I've been out of the boat before, and I'm not afraid to get out of the boat again. Next week, um, we're going to have a special speaker. Um, the one thing that uh, I did not want to do when um, God asked me to pastor this church was uh, go it alone. Um, I learned that being alone is no fun. Um, I remember 30 plus years ago, I wanted to wanted to have my own business because I thought it'd be great. It'd be so much freedom. I could do what I want. I could pay myself whatever I wanted to. Now I'll tell you what, it's the loneliest place I've ever been in was having my own business. When when I had you know a few hundred dollars in the bank and I had a seventeen thousand dollar payroll on a Friday, you know. And um, and that went on and on and on. And it's like Every week, God would give me the manna, you know, just enough manna to get me through, you know. And, um, yeah, I've told you many times, you know, I learned my relationship with the Lord during those lonely times, you know. And I had my own struggles as, as well, family struggles and personal struggles. And, like, who and why did I wish that I set this on me? Uh, and, uh, but I also believe God prepared me for this because... You don't think that this is a lonely spot. It's a lonely spot. Isn't it, Toby? When you feel like you got a speech impediment and you know you gotta bring forth the word of the Lord, right? You can come up, you can come up with 18 reasons not to do it, and only one to do it. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, when you have your own business, you don't have a you don't have a corporate office to depend on. You know, when you're in trouble, you, you can't just, hey, you know, can you send me some help? It just isn't there. But I've asked specific people, uh, respected ministers. One you saw a few weeks ago when Pastor Bob, he came. He has apostolic oversight over the house. Um, I have also uh, come to know uh, Ron Domina. Ron Domina has apostolic oversight over uh, a church in Rochester called Bethel, Bethel Christian Fellowship. Um, I've gotten to know him. Um, he holds it. What are called life apostolic network meetings up in Rochester. I get to meet all the ministers, and uh, it's where the it's where the pastors get fed. Um, but we also have pulled from him and used him as a resource. Uh, Don and, and Lee have contacted. What's when I hear something funny is me and Lori here. Uh, we used to be best buds, and uh, we're still good friends. I mean, but back in high school. And there was three of us. There was me, Lori, and uh, back then her name was Debbie Tutel. Her name is Debbie Anderson now. Uh, but we were like the three amigos, and uh, we were just good friends, and we just enjoyed each other's company. Uh, uh, we 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 uh, we were really good at uh, coordinating parties. Uh, we got away from that. Uh, but what's funny is all three of us have come to know the Lord after high school. And Debbie Anderson, I didn't even know this, she is the executive secretary of Bethel, 
And so we talked to Debbie. And so it's like God has reconnected us. Uh, and uh, you just never know what he's up to. So Debbie Tutel, Debbie Anderson now, uh, she has, uh, she, she opens up her, uh, her expertise to help our church, help us organize. And, uh, and Ron Domina has been so gracious to us. And uh, I, I get to see him whenever I can. But he's, he, uh, he just offers a perspective that I want regionally. I want to, I want to know the heartbeat of this region. And, uh, and we've found favor in his eyes. Uh, and so I wanted him to come. He, he keeps his ear to the prophetic uh, in this region and even across the country. Uh, he's brought major prophets into his church, uh, prophets like Chuck Pierce and, and uh, a few others. Uh, and uh, You know, the Bible says to believe in the Lord and you will be established. And believe in his prophets and you will succeed. So there is a prophetic voice in this country. There's a prophetic voice in this region. And you can have your ear to a lot of things right now. You might not even know what news to watch right now. I don't know because I, I shut it off. I told you that I, I shut off things like Twitter and I... Because, you know, we want to turn on the news and see if there's something good that's happening, you know. Something that's going to encourage me. <laughs> but it isn't out there. So I want to hear what the Lord is saying. So I think for us to listen to the prophetic is very important. And I asked him to do that next week. I asked him to share with the church uh, from a regional standpoint and even from a prophetic standpoint what God is saying to the church. And so I encourage you to be here. It's going to, it's going to be powerful. The other thing that's happening the next day, uh, so that's Sunday, that's a week from today, and then the following day, Monday, uh, we typically have the Life Apostolic Network meetings uh, up at Bethel. Uh, but he wants to have it here. Uh, he sees Batavia as a very strategic point. We've seen that for years. Uh, you just never know what God is up to. And I said, bring it on. So we're going to invite ministers from the region uh, to come and hear what the Lord has to say. And he said, be sure to invite your church. We don't, he doesn't do that. But he, he wants it to leave it open for anybody who wants to come to it. It's, it's for ministers um, and leadership. Uh, but he loves this church and he wants to open it up for anybody who feels you want to come. That is at 10 o'clock uh, on, on Monday. I don't know what that date is. Would that be the 11th? That's the, that's the 11th. Monday the 11th. Life Apostolic Network meeting at Cornerstone Church. I'm excited about it, but I wanted to announce it to you so you know what was happening. Amen? Amen. So I believe, uh, I believe in 2021, uh, God's going to be do, doing a lot of things, and I believe... We're going to see the Holy Spirit moving more than we've ever seen him move. I, I believe it's going to be evident with the people that come to our church, and I believe giftings are going to begin to manifest. Uh, they could be spiritual giftings, or it could just be giftings and talents that God is raising up in his people. If you're here right now, God's got a place for you, and I, and I, I want to see that manifested. And you might say, well, Paul, you don't understand what my personal struggles are right now, because I'm going to tell you why. As I told you before, when I asked the Lord, I said, I need to see the power of God moving to this place. I said, don't ask me to pastor a church and you're not here. <laughs> you know, I've seen what church can look, look like. And I, don't, I, I got to a point, I didn't know what church was for. This house got to a place, I didn't even know what it was for anymore. I didn't see the power of God. I, all I saw was people leaving. And people getting discouraged and people getting mad at each other. And friendly fire. <laughs> it's like I never see anybody leave the church because somebody in the world offended them. It's always friendly fire. Because that's what the enemy loves to do. When a church loses its purpose and loses its meaning, and there's no power of God moving anymore. 
I'm going to tell you what, there's nobody perfect in here, including me. I am probably going to offend you at some point. I promise you. I doubt if I won't. I probably already have. <laughs> Somebody's probably already left because I have. I don't know. I don't mean to, but I'm human. But I've got to see the power of God moving in this house. I said, God, I look in the Bible. You tell me to read my Bible. And I see where you were with Moses. And I see where you were with David. And I see where you were with, with Joshua. Well, them guys are dead. <laughs> They're with you now. I'm here. And we got people here. You've got to be with us now. I don't care who you send. Give me people who are hungry for the Lord. People who are hungry to see power, not only in their own life, especially their own life. That's the God that we serve. That's the God I want to tap into. And I don't care how long it takes. I really don't. Amen? I'm not mad at you, no. I'm mad at the devil. I see what he's done to the house of the Lord. But see, something's changing. There's something changing. My God. You know, turn, all I can say is turn your personal struggle into a personal relationship during the struggle. Those of you, a lot of this came forth. When I began to, I said to the Lord, I said, I need the Holy Spirit to move. He said to me, don't you ask me for that unless you're serious about it. Don't, don't start praying for the fire of God unless you want to see the fire of God. I'll tell you what the fire of God does. You know, we start praying for the fire. The fire exposes things. It brings stuff to the surface. And it has in this house. Because the Bible says that judgment comes first to the house of the Lord. So God is, when I say judgment, it means he's going to bring, he's going to expose things in the house. So that he can deal with it. Because he loves his church. He died for his church. He died for his people. But he's going to expose some things. And many of you know, and I know, that there's been struggles and it's come forth and I've heard about them. It's not, it's not something wrong. It's something that's something is right that is happening. It's been a tough year. But God, is, God has not finished. And that thing that's exposed itself in your life that you struggle with, turn that struggle, that personal struggle, into a personal relationship. Listen to this. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored, in other words, I pleaded with the Lord three times, that it might leave me. Anybody been there before? Like, Lord, just take this from me. This tendency that I have, this thing that I'm dealing with, why can't you just take it out of me? I'm pleading with you. And he said, my grace is sufficient, number one. My grace can handle that. I know that you're human. I know you've got frailties. I know that you live in a corrupted body, in a corrupted world. But my grace is sufficient. That's what it says. And then we always forget the next verse. For my power is perfected in weakness. I asked the Lord, you are here right now because we prayed you in. Lord, give me the weak. Give me the struggling. Give me people that are hungry, that want to see change in their life. Hunger is a powerful thing. So that thing that you're dealing with, let's just set the record straight. God knows your weakness. Weak, what's that song we just sang? Weak made strong in the Savior's love. He knows you're weak. Don't avoid the house of the Lord. Don't avoid the relationship. Cry out to him. Amen? Amen. Romans chapter 8, verse 20. For the creation nature was subjected to frailty, futility, and frustration. Not because of some intentional fault on its part, but by the will of him who so subjected it. You're dealing with frailty. You're dealing with frustration because God wants you to. <laughs> he, he doesn't want you exalting yourself. You're going to learn that you can't depend on yourself. You're going to learn that self-confidence is overrated. You want to be God. Come on. Confident. 
You, know, you want your confidence to be in Him. He's going to let you see yourself. He's going to see, let you see the stuff that's in you that you want to go. Lord, why do I, why do I respond to it? Because I'm going to build a relationship with you. You're going to understand how much I love you. Did I not say that I'm a friend that sticks closer than a brother? So I'm just setting the record straight. I'm making sure that condemnation and accusation doesn't have power in this house. Because God's going to use you. He's going to use you. God allows frustration in man. That's what that says, so that we will, we will turn to him. I get frustrated every week. <laughs> you know. He reminds me every week, and I need, I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. That nature itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and corruption. How many feel like you've been corrupted in your life? I know I have. And gain an entrance into the glorious freedom of God's children. Skip to verse 24. For in this hope we were saved, but hope, the object of which is seen, is not hope. For how can one hope for what he already sees? But if we hope for what is still unseen by us, we wait for it with patience and composure. So too, the Holy Spirit comes to our aid and bears us up in our weakness. The Holy Spirit can be in your life even while you're dealing with the weakness. Verse 27, and he who searches the hearts of men knows what is in the mind of the Holy Spirit. What his intent is because the Spirit intercedes and pleads before God on behalf of you. You are the saints. Yes. yes, even during your struggles. Do we want to do we want to walk away? Do we want do we want to break those chains? That and that sin that so easily besets us. Of course we do. You know, even Jesus said after he healed the beggar, this beggar that, that couldn't even get up, he said, Pick up your pallet. Pick up your pallet and walk. Huh? The pallet, I think, people carried him around on this pallet. Some translations say, Pick up your bed. He lived on this pallet, he lived on this bed. He said, pick up your pallet and walk. And then he said, and walk away from sin. And sin no more. So that something more powerful doesn't come on you. I had no idea what a paralyzed beggar, what kind of sin a paralyzed beggar can get into. I mean, what the world did he do? He said, sin no, sin no more, or something more powerful may come upon you. I don't know about you, man. When I've been in sin, things that I couldn't break, and I, I'd fall back into it, and every time it seemed like I had more power over me. Until, until I couldn't take it anymore, and I, and I let go of it. That was, that was years ago. I had the Holy Spirit in me at that time. I still struggled. Some of you want to be delivered immediately. Well, Paul, you know, we just we, just lay hands on me. I tell you what, that didn't happen to me. I had to walk. I had to walk through it, and in the midst, I developed a relationship with the Lord. I tell you what, those scriptures that Toby was sharing last week, it was he he learned those through the struggle, not because I told him to preach, right? If you don't know how to pray to the Lord, open up songs and look at the struggles David had. <laughs> Created a clean heart. Why did he say that? Because he knew his heart wasn't clean. The Lord put those, put those for our benefit to know, even know how to pray and how to cry out to him. My Lord, 
My prayer, give me the hungry. I didn't say, Lord, give me the hungry when COVID is over. <laughs> All right, once COVID is over, we'll start having church. <laughs> Give us the hungry now. Hunger is a powerful force. You know, nations can do just about anything they want with the people until they get hungry. I've told you the story about the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia back in 1900 something, 1910, 1911, I don't know. The whole country was changed because of hunger. It was during World War I. And mothers couldn't feed their babies. They were standing in bread lines that went for blocks. They couldn't eat. They were getting hungry and hungry and hungry. And they were trying to, they were trying to obey. They were just stand in the bread line. Just stand in the bread line. But their children were dying. They were hungry until that, until that, until that desperation came forth on them. And they were walking by. This is this was by eyewitnesses of those that I witnessed. The start of the thing that literally initiated that revolution. There were some mothers, and that's something that was mothers that started the revolution. They walked by and they were standing in front of a pastry shop with all these delicate pastries while they were standing in bread lines. So the elite, they weren't hungry, they had their pastries. They broke that window and they broke in. <laughs> and they pilfered all the flour. And when that set that set the people off, and then there was gunfire, and the people rose up, and that's what changed that country. But it was because of hunger. Joseph was elevated to the prince of Egypt because of hunger. His brothers came back to him because of hunger. Sometimes when you get hungry, you're going to step out. You're going to step out. You're going to do some things. You're going to, you're going to get boldness. Maybe you're here today because you're hungry. Maybe because something sent you here. Maybe because things weren't that hunky-dory in your life. <laughs> That's usually a hungry soul, a hungry spirit. That's what I ask the Lord for. And I'm going to tell you what, there's more coming. Because I'm not done praying for it. The Bible says in Proverbs, a worker's appetite works for him. For his hunger urges him on. You know, on the day of Pentecost, there was 120 mightily hungry, desperate men and women waiting for the Spirit of God to move. And what's interesting, Jesus fed the 5,000. And then another time he's fed 3,000, Andrew. I think there was a time he fed 5,000. And then there was another time he fed 3,000. And so you had 8,000. And that's just, that was just the men. That's how many men. That wasn't counting how many women and children were in that. So it's estimated that that, that crowd of 5,000 men was probably close to over 10,000 people that saw the miracles of the Lord. But there were only 120 after he, he died on the cross that were waiting for him, that were hungry for him. God can use a remnant. God can just use a few. Give me the hungry. Don't give me the religious. <laughs> Don't give me the ones that are all churched up. Give me the hungry. That want that relationship with a Savior. I didn't come for the, for the righteous. I came for the sinner, said the Lord. I didn't come for the healthy. I came for the sick. Oh, but he's the great physician. And he can heal you. He can forgive you. But when people get hungry, watch out. A certain desperation comes with hunger. Listen, to, I want to read a scripture to you. 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 3. It says, Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate. How many of you know that lep lepers were outcasts? They couldn't be in the city. They had to stay out. They were outcasts. Not only were they outcasts at this time, but they were desperately hungry. <laughs> Anybody ever feel like an outcast? And they said to one another, why do we sit here until we die? If we say we will enter the city, then the famine is in the city. In other words, the ones in the city are just as hungry as we are. If we go in there, we're going to die. If we sit here, we die also. 
Now therefore come, let us go over to the camp of the Arameans. Now this is the, this is the adversary. If they spare us, we will live. If they kill us, we die. Whether we're going to die, we're going to die. But we're just not going to just sit here. Because a desperate hunger came over them. The outcasts. Not the warriors. Not the ones close to the king. It was the outcasts. And so they arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Arameans. And when they came to the outskirts of the camp of the Arameans, behold, there was no one there. For the Lord had caused the army of the Arameans to hear a sound of the chariots and sound of horses. And if you keep reading, they boogied. They left everything. <laughs> they left everything. Isn't it interesting? Because of the step of a few outcasts, God intervened. It's like, <clears throat> that's what I needed to see. And he could have he changed the situation before they made a step, couldn't he? He's God. But he needs to see hunger. That's what he wants to see. And so they go in there, and then it dawns on them. So God shows up, intervenes. Do you know that the enemy can control your life until you get hungry? <laughs> and so there they are, pilfering this camp that was left by the adversary. So they just stepped into it. Then it dawned on it says, then in verse 9, it says, Then they said to one another, We are not doing right. This day is a day of good news. But we are keeping it silent. So they're in there. And so what do they do? They're like, We gotta go tell everybody. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting? This blows me because this is what I've been seeing. Isn't it interesting that it's the outcasts that begin to talk about the good news? Come on, you can. You gotta come see him. Or give me the hungry. <laughs> give me the outcasts. <laughs> give me the outcasts. Because they'll come in and they'll feel the presence of God and God will touch them. You know, those of us that have been around the word for so long, the Bible says that a satisfied, a satisfied man loathes honey. It's like, I can't eat anymore. Paul, don't preach anymore. <laughs> don't give me anymore. He says, but to a famished man, even the bitter things are sweet. <laughs> So I can tell, I can tell somebody who's struggling about their sin. I don't have to beat them over the head with it, but I can tell them there is hope after that. You know, God can help you. And they're like, tell me, tell me what I need to do. Because a famished man, even bitter things are sweet. And so these outcasts begin to tell, hey, you better come see. They've left. And, and then if you read further, the king goes like, well, wait a minute. Not so fast. Wait a minute. You know, this could be a sub. We, we might want to think about this. Why, why was he like that? Because he he was well to do. <laughs> he didn't need to take that step. He's like, wait a minute. But as the king is saying that, read down further. Because if I just read it, there's no war in it. So there's no telling. <laughs> but read down further. His servants, the ones that have been around him, are listening to him, and they're like, we're willing to go in. Because they were, they saw the hunger. They saw the hunger of the outcasts. And they saw the step of faith by the outcasts. And so it provoked those long-term servants. Isn't that interesting? And they went in and they found goods and belongings strewn all along the road. They left everything. I don't believe God wants you to stay in a place of lack, but he will get you into a place where you are so hungry for change. But God's bringing you into prosperity. God's bringing you into a good place. He's a good God. He's a good, good Father. We don't have to just sing about it. We can enter into it. But 
God causes all things to work together for good to those who are called. Amen? Even your situation, even your struggle, I'm living proof. Outcasts. Those two blind men by the side of the road, they were outcasts. They set them aside. They heard. They couldn't even, they couldn't see Jesus coming, but they heard. And they begin to cry out, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. And it said, the crowd rebuked them. You be quiet. You have no business calling on the Lord. You guys are outcasts. We know him. We're walking with him. You stay there. I don't know. It just says they rebuked him. And so what did they do? They cried out all the more. Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. And it got Jesus' attention. And he said, what do you want me to do for you? They said, we want our eyes opened. And he opened their eyes. We need our eyes open. But it was the outcasts. It's the ones that were told to shut up. No, no, you don't belong there. You don't belong with Jesus. We'll tell you. The woman with the issue of blood, another outcast. She had a a female issue. So according to law, she was an outcast. She couldn't you couldn't even be near her. Right? That's why she had to be separated. She was an outcast. She tried all the doctors. She spent all her money. And she was desperate. And it says she, when she heard the reports of the Lord, she didn't even know Jesus. She didn't know him. She says she, when she heard the reports, she's like, I've got nothing to lose. And so she fought through the crowd. She pressed in. She pressed in. And so she, all she did was, all she could reach was his garment. And Jesus said, okay, healing virtue just left me. He felt it. He didn't, I don't know if he even saw it. He's like, okay, somebody just pulled something out of me. <laughs> somebody just he, somebody just touched me. And his disciples are like, are you kidding me? <laughs> They're pressing you in from all over. We're right here. We're all touching you. He's like, uh, 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 somebody touched me. <laughs> you guys ain't touching me. <laughs> The healing comes out when somebody presses in me and touches me. Amen? Amen. My God. You might not know, but this is a good word. <laughs> there was no other way for her to get a miracle. You know. She was the outcast. She was the unclean one. The undesirable. Nobody wants her around. She doesn't want to touch Jesus. Lord, give me that. Pray them in in the name of Jesus. I told you about that that bus that we picked up years ago from a recovery house. I don't even think they were recovering. I think they were just steep in addiction. I had a whole bus. Remember that, Brother Allen? Some of you people have been here a while. They came in. They, we were in the old church there. Our church, man, we was a good church. We were praising the Lord. We thought, you know, who would want to be here? And, uh, and then they came, they showed up, and like, ooh, there's a bunch of outcasts. And they all stayed together. They are all kind of toward the front, all packed together. And, um, and then worship started. And I heard a sound of hunger like I'd, eh, like I'd never heard in my life. And we saw healings take place with them. They went in front. And I was there, I watched them get healed, physical issues. I hadn't seen healings. We saw them occasionally, but they pulled it out. It was almost like pastor was just like preaching to them. <laughs> like, give me somebody who's hungry. Like, God can do something with hunger. Yeah. I know you're struggling. But, uh, you know, sometimes you've been hanging out with the Lord so long, you know, it can get, you know, you get full when God really wants to use you. But he must want to see desperation and hunger and people placing a demand on him because the Bible is filled 
with those kinds of analogies. And then he uses a parable in Luke 18. It says, now, he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart, saying in a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. In other words, he was a bad dude. Nobody liked him, and he didn't like people. And there was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him, saying, give me legal protection for my opponent, for my opponent. For a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, even though I do not fear God, nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. <laughs> yeah, that was his motive. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said. How will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Isn't it interesting how Jesus equates faith with persistent prayer? He's like, that's what he's looking for. Cry out to him, not just once, continuously do. Con continuously seek his word. Find yourself in the word. Find where he speaks to you in the word. Amen? Yeah. I'm not promoting that. That's his word. He promoted it. The unrighteous judge is like, this woman's wearing me out. <laughs> okay, if it works for her, how much more is the Lord going to hear us? He wants to see it in your own way. Okay, you're in a struggle. Maybe it's a good thing. Okay, maybe 2020 wasn't a good year. Maybe it was a good thing. Maybe, maybe it wasn't a bad thing. <laughs> maybe some things had to be shut down for a while. You know. Maybe things had to be a little inconvenient. Us Americans, we're so spoiled we're out of week, we have no idea. No, no idea what really suffering is, right? <laughs> you know, we think of our microwave isn't working. It's like, you know, I, I struggled today, but. I think Lucifer got into my microwave. Like, like Lucifer? You mean like the big guy? <laughs> you mean like the big guy? Like he dropped everything and went into your microwave and shut it. I know, because, it, it, you know, but God says, you know, you know, there's no test beyond what I'm able to handle. You know? And so God, God, so I, I regain my strength and I use the real oven. I turn on the oven. And it took a while. It was hard. I was hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really think about you know, our problems, you know. But we'll give testimonies like that. I don't have plenty right now because, you know, hey, you know, I didn't ask to be born in America, obviously, you know. But uh, sometimes you got know, to put things in perspective. Amen? Amen. Yeah, we love to say, well, you know, Paul, God's in control and, you know, it's all in God's hands, you know. Uh, but that's not always true. God can allow things until we pray something forth. He wants to hear the cry of his people. He says, when I come to the earth, will I find faith? Persistent prayer. He's talking about somebody crying out. And he called that faith. Yeah. Oh, well, I don't feel like I have any faith. Cry out. It's when you can't see it, but it's when it's faith. Right? Put your petitions on that prayer wall. You and God, we pray for that wall. Put things that are close to your heart, things that you're struggling with. Put it on that wall. Pull out all the stones. Amen? Amen. All right, I'm winding it. In Luke chapter 14, verse 16, it says, But he said to him, A man was given a big dinner, and he invited them to eat. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slave to say to those who have been invited, come for everything is ready now. I believe, I got a feeling, everything is ready right now. What we were ready. But they all like began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I bought a piece of land and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have married a wife, and for that reason, I cannot come. <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe that at all. And the slave came back and reported to his master 
And then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the slave said, master, what you have com commanded has been done. And still there was room. And the master said to the slave, go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. You know, I don't know if you've noticed, but something very interesting is happening in this house. You know, we, were, we were down to 12 people, maybe 12 people. Paul, you're now the pastor of this church. <laughs> you know, uh, Greg, you know. Does anybody want to stay? Not me. <laughs> you know, here's an excerpt. I don't know if you remember when Daniel, like Daniel saw that they were still in exile. And he's reading Jeremiah's prophecy. And he's noticing that the exile was only supposed to last 70 years. And it, like 70 years had come and gone. And so he began to he began to cry out to the Lord. And even that, that scripture that we like to quote, it says, uh, for I know the plans that I have for you, say the Lord, not plans to harm you, plans to prosper you, to give you hope and to give you a future. That was our mantra at New Hope, when we're New Hope. But then the next verse says, when you cry out to me with all your heart. And Daniel read that. He read that. He began to cry out to the Lord. He began to call out to him. Here's part of his prayer. He says, so now, our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his supplications. And for your sake, O Lord, let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary. That's what I pray to him. You, this is what you want? This is what we build this house for? Because <laughs> I don't want it. <laughs> you know, thanks, but no thanks. Either your face is going to shine on this house, or I'm leaving. I got hungry. And so a few of us begin to meet for prayer. They said, well, Paul, now that you're a pastor, you have to have Wednesday night services, too. You know. So that's what churches do. They have the Sunday. They have two services. They have the evening one. And then there's Wednesday. I'm like, I'm having one on Sunday, and I ain't having it on Wednesday. It's number one. I, I, I'm not that good. I can't come up with messages twice a week. <laughs> you know. It's like... It takes everything I had to get one, you know. I said, but I, what I will do is we're going to pray. We're going to pray Tuesday nights. And what's happening in this, even through prayer, there's churches around the country, bigger churches that don't see that. I don't promote prayer. I, I just say, come and pray. And most of the people that come probably have their own personal issues that they're dealing with. Go out to the highways and the hedges. I don't know what's in the highways or what's in the hedges, but it can't be too desirable. Go out and my house filled. I said, I tell the other churches, I, I don't know, you, you might have thought I was off last week. I was preaching last week. I thought I, I thought I was on vacation. But Pastor Larry Blaze made me preach to this church. And I told him, I said, my my long-term members are energized by seeing, seeing people come to the house of the Lord. They're energized. That's what's going to happen. Because many of you think you're sheep. Some of you are sheep, but many of you are shepherds. <laughs> You've been sheep, but you're shepherds now. I'm sorry, but you are. You're under shepherds. Shepherds of sheep, right? So you go ahead and pray for the lost. Pray for the undesirables. Pray them into the house. Pray them problems and all, sins and all. You know, I own a trucking school, and I have to hire truckers to be teachers. And it's not an easy thing. First of all, I've got to clean up their language. For certain adjectives, you're not using it in my school. For one. And they think that, well, you know, I'm a million miler. And so, well, that's good. But, you know, these are people that are scared to death. And you gotta teach them how to drive something that weighs in excess of 40 tons. 
So a lot of times they don't, they, you know, they talk all this proud talk, and then when it's time to come, they're like, oh, I don't know how to do this. I said, this is what you do. I said, I want you to, you don't have to teach, just go out there. So this is a first day instructor. Go out there, and I want you to drop and hook your trailer. You know, coupling and uncoupling, that's all that is. I want you to drop it and hook it. And just let the students watch you do it. And so I'll look out the window, and sure enough, there was the new instructor. And then there's like six students that are like following him around. <laughs> um, he's he's going like they talk, they're all following him, following him around. And you know, like even like something like uh, there's a you ever see those little coils between the, the tractor, the power unit, and the trailer? That's those are airlines. When they connect, they're called glad hands. So see them connect them, and then you see instructor, because yeah, it all invariably that raises questions, like, well, what are those things? Those are the airlines, you know. Those are glad hands, so they have to explain it. And the students are just amazed. It's just, I never knew that. Well, that instructor comes in, and he's like, oh my gosh, that was great, you know. He got energized because he was able to share something, something that was simple to him. These students have never seen, never heard. I was wondering what those things will work. You've got stuff in you, simple things. You've got words of life in you. I'm sorry you do. Get some people around that are starving for somebody, someone that's hungry for some hope, somebody who's hungry for forgiveness, somebody who's hungry for deliverance, somebody who's hungry to be loved. Somebody who's hungry to not be rejected for the first time in their life. Somebody that's able to love the unlovable. Because the Bible says, and I'll show you, those are who we're to associate with. That's who Jesus died for. My Lord. Stand to your feet, please. Thank you, Lord. Anybody here feel the love of the Lord in this house? That's what love and beyond all else. That's what I want people to feel. It's the love of the Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this place, Lord. Father, I know I've heard people saying they want to see revival. Lord, give us revival. Lord, I declare right now, I believe we're in it right now. I believe we're in it. Revival means rejuvenation. It means revitalization. It means restoration. It means resurrection. Lord, I saw this place when it was dead. I saw it when it was a desolate sanctuary. And Lord, we haven't seen anything yet. Lord, we cry out to you. Father, there's people that here that are desperate for you, that are hungry for you. And for every person that stands here, there's loved ones attached to them. Loved ones that we're believing for. Maybe even some loved ones that have rejected us. But Lord, you're going to use those that you've called to this house in a mighty way. To even, to even usher forth a revival in this day. A time when people are desperate. They're desperate for change. Even this whole coronavirus, Lord. Father, I know you can cause those things that look like they're for our destruction to be for our development. You can cause all things to come together to work for your good and for your glory and for your people, Lord. Father, I thank you for that. Lord, let us enter into it, Lord. Let your word today pierce our hearts and pierce our spirits, Lord. I thank you for those that are in, their, in this house, Lord. Let there be no condemnation. Let them know that they're loved. We love them. We love them with the love of the Lord. Lord, I pray for breakthrough. I pray for finances today. Even those that are, are struggling in their finances. It looks desperate. Lord, I have been there. Send forth the man from heaven. Lord, those that have debt. They say, how in the world did I get into this debt? You said to pray to you, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us. 
Lord, I release a spirit of forgiveness, Lord. You are a forgiving God. Forgive us for getting into debt. I speak forth provision into this house. I speak provision into your people. I speak health into the body. I come against stress and anxiety and worry. You didn't call your people to worry. And I command the enemy of our souls to leave. Let him leave gladly. Let him be anxious to leave. God's saints today. And Lord, I thank you to re-energize, Lord, even your seasoned people, that they would have a new hope and a new purpose in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. My God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. stood and she has stood. And even as she's been about your business, Lord, I thank you, Lord. She doesn't know you've been about her business, Lord. And Father, I speak even to her. I speak to her family and her children, Lord. And Father, even relatives, Lord. Lord, I even though she's like, they just, they just seem unmovable. They seem like they, they'll never know. Nothing is impossible with me, saith the Lord. Lift up your head, O woman, O prayer to the Lord. Intercede, intercede, cry out to the Lord, for the Lord is ready to move in a mighty way. Thank you, Jesus. My God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Don't you love the Lord? Don't you love his word? Aren't you glad there's a place he can come to? To receive. Jesus. My God. Don't show him. Amen. God bless you. We love you.